Welcome everyone to our second in-person DSG uh, seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Essam Mansour. Essam is a professor at Concordia University since 2019. And prior to that, he was a scientist, research scientist at uh, Qatar uh, Institute of QCRI yeah, uh, for six years. And prior to that, he was in Saudi Arabia at Kaos uh, as a postdoc and in, in, in Germany, and he uh, holds a PhD from Ireland. So very international career, five countries in that, you know, two sentences that I told you. Um, so Assam uh, has published many papers in, 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 in top database and systems conferences. Um, he's a very he's a systems oriented researcher and has done a lot of sort of systems work in um, large scale data management and processing, uh, for example, studying elasticity in the cloud. I am most familiar with his work on, on, on graph data and, and, and graph processing. And today he's going to tell us about uh, a new data lake platform that he is, he is building where they use knowledge graphs and the application of, of that knowledge. Graph. So I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you very much. Just yeah, of course. I could, I can see my, so I can't see the mouse. Uh, is it, uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, I think you can see. Ah, no, okay. So move it here, or should yeah, I? Just so, yeah. Do you want to see yourself? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> if someone okay. asking, we yeah, will show up. It's... And if you remove this one too. Okay, so let me this one. Yeah. And move it. Yeah. Yeah. So we are a little late, so we'll we'll end a little late. Okay. So we have the room reserved. Okay. Okay. Perfect, I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, again, my name is Issam Mansour, and today I'm happy to appear with you the work I'm doing at my group called Linky Data Science. Just Linky Data Science is, is like a huge area, and I'm mainly from the background of uh, databases and survey systems. I work it with different, you know, workloads, like analytical workloads uh, and transactional workloads for relational data and for graphs. And since uh, 2016, I have been working with data discovery and data preparation for data science from system perspective to optimize that. I moved to Concordia in July 2019, and I was starting my research program focusing on automating different aspects of uh, data science platforms. What I want to know more about that. I mainly published in database conferences. Now, before we start about linking data science, we just need to get a step back about open data science. Open data science is an initiative now to let us publish and share what we're doing in terms of data, in terms of pipelines, and tools that we are actually doing. Examples of that, federal government, they have open data portals, like federal government of Canada, US, everywhere, they try to share data, transparency. Uh, open, the, open machine learning uh, workers like uh, Kaggle, OpenML, they have thousands of pipelines and datasets. Now, when we speak about pipelines, I am mainly uh, focusing on a pipeline as data plus tools. This is what you need to imagine about when I say pipeline. Just keep in mind, we are going to have something like this. You have your own data, and for this data, you need to load it into your script. And then you can maybe go in the traditional pipeline of doing transformation, cleaning, and then you start modeling. This is a, a, a typical traditional, you know, machine learning pipeline or data science pipeline. These open data portals for pipelines and for data, they are providing very valuable knowledge about how you can develop, you know, and get insights from data. However, this is available using a very limited kind of metadata where you can search. You go for Kaggle. Kaggle has a huge amount of this information, but you cannot automatically explore this knowledge. You need to manually go through some metadata in order to find something very much here. And this is limited because this metadata is also not automated. Like the actual metadata is not extracted automatically. It is, has been provided manually, which is not going to scale. This is some figure just to imagine the amount of data we have access to. This is what I call it like uh, data science artifacts. Data that is available in enterprises 
in South Africa. But when I was working with this supervisor, which is Merck, Merck is he has 4,000 databases where their data scientists need to access and find something relevant there. And open data workbooks, they have thousands of data sets. Plus, all the scripts that is available on OpenML and in Kaggle. Not only that, even at the enterprise level, at a certain enterprise, they have, our, they have their own repository where every data scientist need to push their work, like the pipelines they develop. And this is huge number two. And the bad thing here, we have very limited search capabilities and kind of exploring this kind of data. The problem, and that's what I want to focus on, we would like to automate the learning. You have a huge amount of knowledge, how things have been done. And based on what has been done, I can learn how can I do, you know, things for similar data sets. And this is why we have this initiative, Open Data Science. They aim to have a kind of unity between researchers, engineers, and data scientists, you know, working in the field of data science. What is the objective? Share what you do with us. Nowadays, in archive, they encourage you to publish your paper and read a code. We would like to have really visibility. In Kaggle, they have a challenging task. Please upload your, your data set, upload your pipeline. But the reality, this is not only for open data science as a community. Even we need that thing at the enterprise level. Imagine somehow Amazon, they have thousands of data scientists. We are going to build a knowledge base out of what these data scientists was doing with their data at Amazon. Now, this knowledge coming from their data scientists become an asset for Amazon. I envision that this kind of knowledge that we own as, a, as an enterprise coming from all our higher data scientists could be an asset for later to let Bob learning from us. Bob just recently joined you know, the enterprise and would like to do something with the data set. Again, over, over the cycle for similar data sets, we build similar pipelines. Can we somehow transfer the knowledge from Alice to Bob automatically? In real life, when you go to work in this field of data science, you need to socialize very well with people. You know, we have been told when we work with Merck that data science need to really find connections, not through a computer system, but through their mobile phone. You know, I am working with a certain task. This task is using, you know, real estate data. And I need more data in order to have better accuracy. It's hard to find it automatically. You need to communicate with someone. Maybe they have better knowledge. Maybe they did before. So the thing is that the way Alice was solving the, uh, the problem, the tasks in data science she has been doing, can be somehow a very, very good, you know, could be transferred to a similar data set. You know, and this is the thing that we would like to have. Examples. This is the way things are working right now and the limitations. This is a typical scenario where you have different apps. This could be different groups in the same industry, in the same company, could be different, you know, research lab in different universities. Each one of these scientists, data scientists, they have their own local data set. And they keep from open data portal or the portal of the company, you know, like the data lake. These keep getting data and joining. Now, can we learn from the way they have been augmenting the data set and the joining way they are doing at the, the level of data, the way they have been trying to grow and augment the data set, meaning doing joining or unability? This is something we can learn automatically, what we call it like the discovery. But also, a new scientist now. I don't need to start from scratch. I can, day one, I get a new task or a new data set. And I can ask, did anyone in my community, in my company, build a data science pipeline for this data set? What was the accuracy? So we are not going to start from scratch. This is something like if you are going to chat with someone to get started this insights. 
for while developing exactly my work line, I can actually, you know, get guidance, you know, based on what has been done. Yes. So can you think of like the goal of the the, the what 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 you what you're showing here as maybe an extended copilot that as your type will tell you oh you could you know get these other data sets and you could integrate with other data sets. Is that the type of interaction that you would like to propose? This is a very good point. Copilot or AlphaGo, you know, uh, 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 AlphaPoot, you know, this is good examples that is actually trying to automate what you can do in programming. And the thing that, to the best of my knowledge, what we are talking about today to automate the guidance for data science pipelines, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any system for that. Coding, yes, you can see that, as I mentioned in the abstraction, pipeline is data plus code. But this code is not a general code. This code, for example, consistently dealing with a certain kind of stage, like you go through the stage of data preparation, data transformation, data cleaning, and then you go for doing classification or you know using different specific classifier or machine learning technique. So the general thing that has been done in code, as I will show today, is not going to work effectively here. But the, the target in terms of an objective, yes. You know, I'm support, for example, from, uh, you know, DeepMind, you can give a description of task, but this task is a programming task, like sorting, and then you generate the actual code. Can we do that for uh, for data science? We are going to see at the end. But this is a vision, where we go. Another thing that, if you are aware, like in my group, we work mainly with knowledge graph and graph neural network techniques, and distributed systems. If you are aware of the correlation between knowledge graph and AI, a lot of domains, like in drug, like in, in order to get new medicine, they have this drug drug discovery. By doing what? By, in, by having the all the semantics as a knowledge graph, and then they automate tasks using AI on top of the knowledge graph. And this is even in EV market. Like, we would like to get very efficient material for the battery. They also have a knowledge graph, and they try to automate the tasks in this domain, in this application, using the knowledge graph. The thing is that when I started, I was trying to combine all my previous experience. I recommend that we are not trying to automate data science platform is based on data science and based on knowledge graphs. We solve with this like statistical methods or you know hyperparameter optimization where you are building very huge search base and you try to find optimal parameters. But why not build them this very valuable knowledge? Here, what you see here, what I call it data science artifacts. Data science artifacts here is the data that you are dealing with. You can look at this maybe like a data lake. And all these by line, where you have to do certainly every organization, they have their own rhythm where they, where they ask their uh, data scientists and programmers to load pipeline there, food here, all these. However, this is actually in raw data, like this is like CSV file, JSON document, or a specific pipeline written in R or Python. How to consume for building models on top of it? So the idea is to move from this layer to a semantic layer where we are extracting semantics out of data. And you, you ask someone from database background, if you are extracting semantics from a data leak, you're actually moving to something like a catalog or a global scheme. Global schema with known for heterogeneous data sets in order you know, to build these connections between data coming from different sources. At that level, just keep in mind, we are not going to get the raw data, but we are going to build only semantics. Like maybe this is a data set, and this is a table, and this is actually columns connected to this table. Now, once we work at that level, we try to find connections between similar columns. One thing we recognize, the raw data is still very valuable to be considered here, but we would like to work at a scale. So what we do, we actually apply deep learning techniques in order to generate representation learning, embedding or vector representation of the raw data that is here in terms of columns. This is, will be attached with these nodes. So this is going to be used later as a signature for the column content. 
based on the similarity or based on how far a vector representation of a certain column to another one, we can decide similarity. But not only that, now we can also abstract, you know, by blind, extracting semantics of by blind. We don't care at that level here at the exact syntax you are using, but who cares that what you are trying to do is transformation or cleaning, or maybe you are using a specific classifier with certain parameters. All these semantics, we should have it at that level. And this is actually going to be the first time ever to see a knowledge graph that is connecting a global schema or a pattern to all kinds of pipelines has been applied to these columns, has been applied to these tables. From that, we can see a lot of other applications as I will show. In order to do that, we have two things we have as a mission. This is first to profile data and the profiling aiming at constructing this global schema or this pattern. And by blind abstraction, that is aiming at abstracting the semantics of operations you did and interlink that with the data nodes. Someone may say, oh, yeah, and, and then once we have this knowledge graph, we can automate different things. We can automate the automate problem, as I'm, I'm going to speak later. We can automate the data preparation, feature discovery. This is now the thing that we are going to find out how we can do. But before we go there, this is not totally new. If some of you are speaking about knowledge graph, and we have some work that is actually capable of querying knowledge graph to extract the structured data. And this, you can tell now, this is a little bit different from what we do. Because like this is not like a DBpedia graph where we have instances of data. As I mentioned, our graph doesn't have the instance of the data. So this is clearly like another kind of work that is different from us. There is also this kind of work that at certain stage we have a complete database. And I would like to move from structured data to an RDF graph. So there is some tools in order to actually map these instances through into, you know, uh, you know, SEO, like uh, subject related object in a knowledge graph. We don't do that too. And this is by design choice, because if we work with the raw data, we are going to end with any scalable system. And the other thing that I was working, this is in closely with people in industry, and they don't like to have duplicate duplication of the data. We are not going to have a sum, we are not going to forget it, to have a double of this data lake. It is enough to manage one data lake. This is why at the level of what we are doing, we are doing only with the semantics. We don't have access to the raw data. More than just the signature, the embedding of each column, we don't have any raw data. So this is clearly different from us. There is also this work, you know, by Rene Miller actually for working at, at, on organizing metadata. So they say that in data lake, we have a lot of data coming with a lot of metadata. Why not organizing this as a hierarchy? And as done on organization, we we'll published in Sigma 2020, and we work with that. As you see, one good advantage of what we do, we generate the metadata that we need, that is related to the global schema. We do not rely on a given metadata. Something like Amenderson, it is a well-known uh, tool for their discovery, used usually with the data breaks, but they rely on a huge amount of effort to create metadata. This doesn't, doesn't scale from my point of view. Like to have visualization to keep feeding this system with metadata is not a realistic assumption. The most related one is this one, rond 3 l and the Santos. Those are trying to actually building a kind of a knowledge graph of a graph or index for the data that is in the data lake. Clearly, what we do, we do something similar here, but we have our graph as a knowledge graph. This is actually nice for portability. Whatever is data structure they generate is blocked on these systems. You cannot, after a very good amount of time to generate and profile data, you cannot just extract this in a different domain. But the thing that is really relevant here, this system doesn't work with pipelines. You have no clue of any, you know, data science pipelines that have been applied to this data. And this is really something significant here. I have been working also 
as I mentioned, since 2016, with Ahmed al Mugarmit and Mike Stone Breaker for actually this particular project. This one is working actually providing very defined blocks, helping in data preparation. But again, in this project, we didn't try to learn from existing pipelines. This is what we are going to show today. There is also a very good work and library about data prep was published in Sigma 2021. And this is again kind of predefined you know, functionality that you can use to help you in data preparation. Data preparation for us is going to be one application on top of our knowledge graph. And we are not going to invent things like here. We are going to recommend based on what has been seen. One kind of related work too is actually if you would like to move from code, like what you mentioned, to a knowledge graph. In order to understand code, there is this dynamic code analysis for which you need to get the code. You need to prepare the domain by like providing all the libraries for the environment, and then you need to run the code, collecting a lot of you know, traces from memory to understand what this code is doing. As you can tell, this is not going to scale. Preparing an environment, running the code on large data as we have in data science is a huge amount of work. This is why, for example, Add was published recently, and their analysis and evaluation is based on five, 500 pipelines. That's it. We managed to show today with 13,800 13, pipelines from Canada. The closest here is, is graphical code from IBM. But again, this is a general purpose tool to generate a knowledge graph from your code. They are going to fail with working with data science in the following. For example, here I would like to, one objective, I would like to, to know the actual type of objects you are going to return. This is actually doing a static code analysis. You don't need to run the code, I'm going only to look at the code. By knowing that, for example, a very simple thing like this, EF, what is the type of EF? They don't have any clue what is the type of DF because it is a static code analysis. What we try to do, we try to enhance that by actually doing documentation analysis of programming. Here you are mentioning that you are using Vanda. Now we can go, this is available, we can go to get Vanda and we analyze it and we get from that the data type. So this is one thing we in, in, in advance here. The other thing that they do not recognize any data you are using which is the actual objective that we have. We would like to enter link between that pipeline and the, code that, the data that you use, like column of tables. We need to figure out that. And now this is moving to our you know, system to first construct this knowledge graph. So as you see here, this is the programming libraries that we have, which is available, you can download. And this is the data lake, or this is the data lake that you have or all the data that you're dealing with. And this is the pipeline. First of all, we start by actually getting these pipelines as correct type. And we are going to apply, you know, imagine this is the that I'm going to follow. We do not need a very specific or complicated, you know, uh, static analysis tool. You, we can just go with the choice of uh, Python and we can get, you know, control flow graph using one of the existing, you know, uh, static analysis tool. And then we do this documentation, you know, analysis in order to now start adding this new node. Like this is a Vanda. This is now related to Vanda. By knowing this information, you can actually now predict the data type of object that is returned. And then the third thing that for data, we now need to do a kind of prediction about usage. So this one is actually accessing a certain file. This file for us could be a potential later to find it in our global scheme. Then once we, yes. Yeah, here, usually, very good point. And we don't, we don't have access, like at that level, we don't try to implement, we don't try to run. We are just trying to understand the script. So what we understand here, this is actually belong to Vanda. And now this one is us, for us is like, we know from understanding the documentation that this function is taking a file for data. 
So we know by understanding the documentation, we, we can actually predict this is uh, a possibility of using data. Okay. And also there is some other function that is applied to code. So we know this is the code. And later we do the connection. Now, once we do that, we now kind of preparing the initial part of the graph. Now we need to do data, uh, data profiling. One thing here, there is a lot of data profiling techniques, and some of them very aggressive by doing uh wise comparison between contented columns. This is, I can tell it doesn't need to scale. In our design choice, we go with analyzing a column independently by collecting some metadata about this column, like how many nouns, how many unique values, what is the distribution of data in this column. It is only at the level of coding. If we, we, we work in distribution, you can tell that each worker is going to get a column and collect all these facts. But there is no any you know, introduction between workers here. We work in an independent task. And one thing we also do here, we generate embedding for this column. We do it also at that level. However, one we want to recognize most of these scholar techniques are focusing on just two types, numerical, non-numerical. And we recognize a lot of false positive because of that. So we said, okay, before we start even working with that, we are going to infer, you know, fine grain data types. So, yeah, this is one thing we are just use a uh, spark data frame in order to be able to connect to different types of data. Now, for fine grain data types, we we deal with with integer float and dates. This is for us could be seen as numerical. And Boolean also, but we distinguish between Boolean and integer. Now, for string, we don't only deal with the string. We deal with, like, in databases, you can find a code that is actually a Boolean name. So it is entity or organization name or a country. So here we have entity names and natural language. Like, imagine that you have a comment from a user or a description or something. So this is natural things. And we have general, you know, strengths. General is really like food. Yeah, you find this is like department food, like uh, CS135, uh, uh, whatever this is general food is like. So here we start first for each column, we try to infer, you know, the, this fine grain data types. Now from there, we don't work to generate embeddings. So actually, we would like to thank Miller for his technique. We inspired by that to build a neural network that is actually learning how to generate embedding for the content. Now, once we do that, we store all these embeddings and we actually classify this based on that type. So, once we have this information, yes. um, so the data profiling is meant to, uh, what is that? It is like, do you have a lot of missing information about the data that you have? Very good point. The objective here is to try to interlink between tables and data that you have in your data lake based on content similarity. So here, what you are trying to do, you collect some statistics and you collect this, we generated this embedding, it is actually a vector of, you know, of 300 dimension. And this is the information that is data that we collected. It is going to help us to, to decide whether two columns are related to each other or not, like based on content similarity, or we also rely on the semantic of the column name. So we have two levels of, of similarity, content and semantic similarity. But the data lake is integrating a lot of different data sources. The column has different names and they might still be the same columns. So yes, exactly like that. I'm going to show you an example of that. Yes. It's actually a very nice question, but why are we looking at one of the columns? Why not row similarity? Yes, very good point. You know, why not rows and look only at columns? You know, the thing that this, this could work also, but it's, not, it's going to change the way we work. Now, we look at the like, data I mentioned before, we would like to build this kind of, of you know, connection between data. So we look at the data vertically, so column by column. This is also inspired by the fact that at the end of the day, for data science, we do analytics. And in, 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 in literature, we find that usually column orientation of data is better for analytical workloads. So like, I'm not expecting we, we are going to do a transactional workload on data lakes. I, I, at least I'm not aware of it. But more, more of it is going to be analytics. 
And now, in order to catch this similar columns, is is good for you. This is why we did it that way. But your your vision is correct too. But it's going to change the design of what we do. Now for the construction. Now, what? Yes. Minimum size of. The embedding we, we are for now we have three uh, three hundred uh, dimension bit, like the vector of three hundred uh, values. And you're embedding a column. Yeah. yeah, every every entire column, the embedding at the end of the day is just three hundred values. Why? Yes, this is a good point. We have been building this from scratch, and we are trying to look at you know um, the ultimate goal to get some functionality. We didn't optimize, like this one thing we were discussing in the team. Like we need to experimenting with the size of the vector. Uh, for sure, the larger vector, maybe the more accuracy. We got enough accuracy with that, and we didn't try to optimize more in that uh, level. But you have a valid point. It is still in the log of our processing. Yes. Yeah, certain size. I, I go to the point. Yes. So for the question about analyzing more the vector size and what will be the minimum that you can go with and the larger, we didn't yet investigate about this, um, but it is in our uh, duty, like uh, we, ha we have it already in the book. Uh, maybe later once if we have it, I will be happy to share with you the file. So we're at middle of the third thing. So yeah. Do you want to delay some questions? Okay. Yeah. So now look at that. We have an initial, you know, uh, subgraph of the knowledge graph that we have, which is related more to the pipelines and connection to data. And now you have this global schema coming by doing pairwise comparison between columns in the same category. Columns in the same category, we are going to do pairwise comparison. And find out whether there is complete similarity or not. We do also bearwise comparison based on the column name or table name, based on order embedding. So in that, we have two types of connections: content similarity between columns, we add link, or semantic similarity between column names or table names, we add another link. Now, once we do that, we go back to each by line that we have where we have this potential usage of data. And then we try to interlink between these nodes and the schema that we have. Okay. And then we are going to end with something like that. This is now the final product. So we have this graph set, uh, data set graph. Here you can see that we have three levels of nodes like data set, like, uh, you know, data source, like Kaggle. From Kaggle, you can get different data sets. And then we have this, you know, uh, Tantalic is like a data set or a table here. And then this is uh, the, the tables, like this is a data set, this is a data source, and this is now the columns. And the connection that you see here is actually based on calculating the similarity based on content or semantic. Okay. Now, another thing we have, we have a similar hierarchy for the programming libraries. And for each pipeline, we are going to have them separated in an empty graph. If you are aware of RDF, you can actually have an empty graph, you know, like only for a certain uh, part of the graph. Why we did that? Because actually, this is a coherent thing that is doing something end to end. So all what we care about is not the everything, but we care about the link. So maybe here there is a read RCB. Uh, read the CSV, and this will be linked to a table. 
or maybe another one that is actually focusing on accessing a certain column and we need link to a column. Okay. Now imagine that you have this knowledge graph for data science. This is what we call it a knowledge graph for data science. At Concordia, we have a really good group uh, working in software engineering. If someone would like to analyze frequency of using libraries or something, they can benefit from that. If someone like us would like more to predict for data preparation, they can use benefit from that, as we'll see. You know, so this is actually like I think, hopefully, what we're doing now, we already have the graph and the system for that. We can enable, hopefully, a lot of applications on top of our knowledge graph to automate different things of you know data science. At the end of the day, we store our knowledge graph in RDF store because actually we have a graph that is annotated with accuracy. So we find that RDF store is actually a good option for that. And most of the existing systems like Bortozo, Stardog, uh, you know, uh, Jana, uh, they actually support uh, RDF store. And we store all the embedding that is generated in an embedding store. Thanks for Facebook, we are using their, you know, embedding store. Now the question is, okay, you did it. How accurate is it? Now, in order to find out how accurate it is, you can look at our graph first as, oh, you said that you have a global schema. So this is more like you're doing data discovery. We are not doing only data discovery. This is one thing we can do. But as I mentioned, thanks for D3M, uh, you know, the authors, they provided, they published the work in ICD 2020, and they published, they actually have a benchmark, you know, uh, in order to evaluate data discovery. Like, would like find, uh, you know, top K related tables for a given table, you know? They, for that, they have two different data sets. It's more RAM and uh, synthetic. Just to, to make it clear here, like the synthetic, the small RAM is like six, 650 more than 650 tables, but this is real data. And the tables are big, like you have an average, you know, uh, 12,000 rows. The other one, like larger number of tables and uh, fewer rows per table. Just to understand here, we have Aron, you know, as a competitor, and we have D3L, and we have KGLens, our technique. And what you see here in x-axis, this is actually varying K, K-related tables to a given table T. And what you see here is the precision, the higher the better. So as you see that, when you actually care about more tables related to a certain table, the larger K, the less precision you're going to get. And this is obvious in the, in the trend here. But the good news here, we're already managing to do very good performance here compared with these two competitors in terms of precision. And this is, to be honest, thanks to our technique for fine grain data types. This is it's still like a simple idea, but the effect, the effect of this idea is really good. Because by actually, for example, ignoring, you know, a float to be only with floats, this is helping to reduce false positives. And in terms of recall, remember everything. This is K, uh, similar tables to a, a given table, and this is the recall that you did the right thing. And still of that, we are slightly better than D3L. We also did it in their, you know, synthetic data. So this is actually larger number of tables. It's more than 5,000 tables. But I have to tell you that it is not about number of tables. It is mainly about the challenging of the content, you know? So as you see here, most of these techniques are like, unlike here, most of these techniques, this is relatively a simple situation. Most of these techniques are doing, you know, similar to each other at the beginning. The good news for us, we are not dropping significantly as other techniques. And in terms of recall, we are just head to head with three, uh, the three arms. Again, we have to tell that for their discovery, we are lacking of uh, lacking very uh, uh, strong benchmarks. More work uh, should be done here. Now, the other part of the graph could be, okay, you can use graph for code to generate the, to abstract the white lines. Here we use 13,800 white lines collected from Kaggle 
and this is top performing in the top, top performing pipelines for the top 1000 famous data sets in Canada. What I have to tell you guys, graph for code are using a static code analysis that is general purpose, which is called Walla tool. And this is actually not working only for Python, but it has been developed for different languages. I think using general things is not going to help here. For us, we go with the simplest choices. Like we go with one of the static analysis to a tool for Python. And one more thing too, abstracting code is not exactly like abstracting by lines. We end with processing this 13,000 800 in 11 minutes, almost 11 minutes, while graph for code needs more than 2200 minutes. This is not because they are, I, I gave them the credit of being generic, but it is not developed with intentions to work with pipelines like that. What is the difference? The difference is something like here. You see that 25%, more than 25% of their graph. It's just about what? About function parameter order. In Python, we don't care much about the order of the parameter, but we care about the parameter itself, which, for example, graph for code doesn't, ha doesn't have ability to extract. Because in Python, I can give you directly the value without mentioning the parameter. So you have no clue what is the parameter name. We can get it from our documentation analysis. And this is the advantage. This is with, and one thing also, they do not interlink the abstracted graph with the different graph. We do it. And we have the, the library in Rocky, they don't do. And one more thing, files in RDF graphs are very important for inferencing. And this is actually the intention. We need these types in order to automate, as I'm going to show you in a few seconds, uh, a lot of things on uh, data science. So the types is important. They don't have types, we have types. This is actually leading to the final product. Our graph is less than, like we achieved more than 80% reduction in the size of the graph. And this is, it's not magic. This is now why we are actually faster here. Okay, we are very close, things working now. Now we are ending here with our, you know, system. So you actually, our uh, knowledge graph development is now building this knowledge graph of data science, which is here with embeddings. Now, this is a graph. You can actually query it while storing it in uh, RDF. We can store it also in probability graph like in 4 or the new system from, uh, you know, Samir, and we can use it too. Yes. <laughs> but the thing is that data scientists doesn't want to write, you know, query languages. So in order to help, we actually brainstorming in our team and we come up with, in, you know, intensive list of API. You can do table search, you can, you can, I would like to get uh, best parameters we have. The things that I would like you to recognize here is the following. We are not replacing existing data science platforms. This is like an announcement. I'm not competing with any data science platform. I'm not changing how data scientists are working in their daily routine with whatever they like as a data scientist platform. Look here, Alice is still using whatever she like, you know, to build her own pipeline and accessing the data based on the authorities and access rights she has. However, she are going to interact with scheduling to extract information from the knowledge graph. For example, Bob is now trying to work with a certain you know, data set. He can actually co connect with our graph to get some statistics or some insights about which classifier I should use now. All the communication with all our APIs is just returning back a data frame. So all what you need to do as a scientist is to just use our library. We already have it right now. By the way, I'm interested. I have I can demo this system for I have a, a meeting with students. I would be happy to demonstrate the system. All what you need one line to import our library for KGLens. And then you call all, all any of these APIs. 
The API wants to return to you a data frame. You, as a data scientist, take this data frame and do whatever you want with this data frame. In, in terms of, of continuing this process, the beauty of what we're doing is that you can build models on top of our knowledge graph, and these models can automate different things in data science. So you can traditional modeling is you can use the embedding to train a classifier, like what we did in order to predict data transformation. Or a more advanced thing, you can actually use GNM to solve new problems in, a, in an existing problem in a different way. Like what we did here. This is our recent, you know, uh, work in automail. We are the state of the art right now by formalizing the automail problem as a graph generation. Automail problem, if you don't know, it's just I'm speaking about the traditional automail problem with existing data sets and benchmark. They have data sets. And for each data set, you need to predict a classifier and the optimal parameters to use with this classifier to get high accuracy for a given data set. As simple as that. How do you solve it? The like famous systems for that, AutoScalern or Flamin. Flamin was developed by Microsoft. They do it as hyperparameter space. Imagine that you have a space of different classifiers, and each of these classifiers connected with different parameters. And now keep trying. It is all about how we navigate this big space. You know, for us, we are not going to work like that. We are actually have a very simple heuristic. For similar data, we have similar classifier used. So what we do, you give me your data set, which is unseen. I didn't see it. So we used here like 11,000 pipelines, and we train our model. And these data sets doesn't include the data set that is in the benchmark from AutoML. So this is unseen one. You got it. We align it to the closest data set based on embedding. And once we do that, this orange node is the data set. We train the model to predict the rest of the graph. So this is now a graph generation problem. Okay. And once we do that, we end with the right classifier. Okay. All what we do, we don't do hyperparameter optimization. We can integrate with Flamin or other learn to continue the process. So instead of Flamin and other learn searching their search base, we are going just to recommend a certain classifier, and they are going to predict the hyperparameter optimizations. We did this integration. And we are the state of the art for that. We managed to show in our B2B paper uh, in Sydney that we are moving to a, a significant improvement here. One more thing here you can actually predict for data transformations. And this is now the beauty. We are solving data science or automating data science by doing data science. Alice, instead of such solving or predicting you know, for a house market, she now can predict for data transformations. So what we did here, based on our 13,000 uh, pipelines, we collected only pipelines that has data transformation in certain columns. We got the embedding of the columns, and we tried to predict to uh, you know to try to model for prediction. For example, we have we are dealing with two categories here: the categorical uh, transformations. This is things that we found in the knowledge graph. Apply to this kind of uh, data and numerical columns like this is the thing that here. This is still preliminary work, but I was eager to have some insights. Like imagine that something like this work, you know, published in a, in a, an AI conference in 2017. They actually have a statistical method based on AI to predict the transformation. We are not inventing a new way. I'm going to embed your, your data, and based on the embedding, I'm going to expect what is the best or near optimal transformation based on what has been seen. And with that, we try with different data sets. For example, we managed to outperform in this one and in this one, and the outperform us here. The thing that their technique is working only for numerical data because they are working with the system. If you have categorical data, it is not going to work. And they said that in the paper. Our technique is working for both because it is working based on what has been seen already. And this is very interesting thing. We got this suggestion for using one hot encoding with this code. One hot encoding is very famous technique with categorical data. I told my story, there is something wrong here. We need to investigate. 
This is numerical data. This is not correct data. Why do we use this? The data is verified. It is indeed used in the in the system. And this is still performing this science. The data science by, by, by line is correct. We analyze more. We figure out, oh, this data is actually categorizing teams. It looks like, you know, numerical value, but it's categorizing teams. And this is something we managed to predict using our models. Now, this is the final product. We call this uh, system KG Farming. Now, this is one application on top of our knowledge graph. That is going to allow both to be guided while writing the pipelines based on Alice spirits transparently without, you know, any talking to each other. Now, this is actually moving to the end of the story. This is the kind of application we have. In my research program, it is not only about that. It is about a complete ecosystem. So while working with this, I am more, as, as I mentioned from system, you know, perspective, we have been doing a lot of things, you know, in order to train models and do everything. We are working with knowledge graph, and this is happening in two isolated domains. Two isolated domains. Where we are building more models, isolated from the knowledge graph, literally isolated. Isolated in the training, you need to extract data, move it somewhere else to start the training. And once you have the model, it is isolated. You cannot use it while wearing the knowledge graph. Two isolated worlds. This is the, the pipeline that, like Alice, while trying to automate models for, you know, predicting anything like this, transformations, we need to query the graph. We need to set a, a, get a subgraph. And then we need to transform this graph into sparse matrices. This is the way graph engineering method can work with. And then you train the models. Now there is a challenge here. Because actually, this, there is not one single model. There is a huge amount of models here you can use. Like, like, Maybe tens or more. And it varies in accuracy. It varies in the situation. Okay. It is not for major people like easy to choose. We have been working a lot in this domain and we figure out how this could be automated. We are aware of the limitations or the requirements of these methods. We are aware of the task that is Alice trying to do. Why not to automate the entire training by applying to you? And another problem here, Alice. She's, she has very good experience, but she ends with different models for the same task. And these models vary in accuracy, vary in time for inferencing. And this, maybe she has, she's good in deep learning and AI. She's not very, maybe really good in, it's hard to find someone good in everything. So Alice would like to find a way to query the graph and using the models. And now someone else, hopefully the query optimizer, is going to choose the best model for here, based on accuracy, based on time. This is challenge. And this is one thing that another project that we're working with. And hopefully, we are not far. I, I hope to come again to present more about this system. It is there already and under submission. But simply that to give you what we do here. We Envision here something like graph machine learning as a service. So this service is going to do automating the training for you based on time and memory budget. And it's going to work also as a hub of models. So I don't need from existing RDF engines to keep creating a stored procedure. We have one stored procedure here that is going to communicate through HP calls to this service. Each model train has it is a knowledge graph, has an identifier like URI. You communicate to say that there is a query here. Hi, the Gmail as a service. We, we have a query here, and this query is referring to this model. It means this is the parameter and give me the inference. So this one will reply with the result. And then the query optimizer is going to over here. And this is actually now the new challenges for query optimizations. If you have a query, with this user defined predicate that is actually referring to a model. How we can calculate the and estimating the cost of this you know, model? This is the challenge that we solve. We already have it. Hopefully, in another meeting, we can speak about it. Another dimension for the ecosystem of what we do, I believe, yes, Sparkle is, is good language. 
But most of the sparkle queries we have are system automated. We are generating the sparkle queries. I'm not going to assume there is a user waiting to write the sparkle query. In my demo, I can show that if you like to write the sparkle query, you can give me a sparkle, I will give it to you. I don't believe this is going to scale. So most of the people doesn't like, even the scientists will not like to write sparkle query. So we are working with a shared board for data science. This is, we have two models of users in our ecosystem. Working with a layer data scientist, they do not like to use interfaces like graphical user interface. They would like to access everything from their code to do whatever they like. This is the first mentality. The second mentality, these managerial, you know, level users, they do not like to write code, but they like to speak their own language, English or French, without support English. So you can actually do question answering in our knowledge graph. This knowledge graph that, that could be implemented for a certain company, certain branch, certain research lab, and by questioning the chatbot, you can get very valuable information. This is my data set. What is the most recent insight has been generated on this? The knowledge graph can answer that. So we work it with question answering system, and we recognize two challenges here. The first challenge, as you can tell, data science actually working with a broad kind of application. It is not only about transportation, healthcare, or, you know, it, it could be any domain. Training a model to make question understanding in this broad kind of, uh, you know, application domain is a challenge. And the other thing is that existing systems for question and, uh, answering systems, we need a huge amount of, you know, pre-processing. To easier to uh, have indices or even have a vector space, like some techniques they rely on generating embeddings for the knowledge graph, which is going to be huge time. So, what we did actually, we had the idea of having a universal question answering system. And universal here, we don't need to be trained for a specific application domain we, to make a question understanding. We don't need to be trained to, in a specific application domain to prepare these indices, which for a analogy graph, like we have indexed the entire Microsoft Academic Graph. This is in terabytes. And this takes like five days from five machines with 32 cores and three terabytes of RAM. Imagine the amount of effort you need to do in order to index this. And we end with this one. I'm very happy that this has been accepted just last week on second. And now we can work as the first knowledge uh, question answering system as a service on the one. You as a user connect to us, give us a, a certain you know, uh, endpoint where you have a graph, give me a query and I start answering. With that said, this is the end. I think it was a little bit boring, but uh, I'm happy that like this what has been published so far from the group. I'm only referring here to the work that has been done, you know, almost from 2020 uh, until today. And by the way, I know there is master students and PhD students here. I would like to refer to this uh, vision paper that was published with uh, Katya Hood. And this is really, so far we solved several problems that we described here. There is a lot of other potential problems there. And this vision, is not for only me and my group. It is for everyone here about data science and automating things in data science. Maybe you will find more things there. Like these two problems, one of the problems that have been mentioned there. And we already demonstrated our work, you know, previously. And I have to thank here the entire team. Like this is not a single man show. This is actually behind it, this great team. I'm really thankful for everyone in my team working in this. Just to give you an idea, I have three main dimensions in my group. This dimension is about uh, knowledge graph governor to build this knowledge graph for data science. In each of these dimensions, I have one PhD student, one master student, or two, and undergraduate students. We have like heavy uh, system development and one big really could be hard. And this is for, you know, the chatbot for data science. Right now we call it KGCAN. And here, where we are working with this, you know, uh, KGNet for uh, Gmail enabled the knowledge graph engine. 
I have also collaboration. We kind of, you know, interested also in cyber security, uh, mainly in data sensitive, sensitive data and uh, cyber attacks. Here we are just using, you know, this is co supervised with someone also. Uh, I'm using working in, uh, in cyber security. We try to use our DNN uh, knowledge and, you know, uh, knowledge graph in order to help in solving these problems. And with that said, thank you very much for, uh, you know, for attending. I, if you have any questions, yeah. Take a few questions. Yes. Uh, is there an issue with sort of correctness of previous implementation? Let's say someone did their code, but their methodology was slightly incorrect, the accuracy is low or high than it realistically is. Would that affect future, like, fraud flow down to the system? You win by date. Why? For two things. You got the way. It's not, you are not inventing your own way of automating things, like, unlike these techniques. You are relying mainly on the cloud. And bad things coming in, bad recommendations come out. I was sitting like you here, not, not in this place, somewhere else, where I was learning about Go Bit translation. It was like almost more than 10 years. And they were proud of the fact that they do not have rule based, you know, uh, linguistic rules to translate. They said that big organization, they provide the same topic, same article in different languages. You can find that a lot, in fact, like you find the article in French and English. Google at that time, more than 10 years ago, they managed to scale to the number of languages they can support, translate from to. Based on this, by they get rid of, you know, rules and they learn from document to document, align paragraph to paragraph and learn how the translation done. I was asking exactly the same thing. I said, oh, but if you got bad documents, you have bad translation. Obvious, yes? He said, yes, we, we cannot deny that. But the thing that it is all about the source. This is why when I was presenting the idea, I said that we collected from the top famous thousand data sets in Kaggle, the top performing, the top perform, I was stressing that, the top performing by blind. In Kaggle, when you upload your pipeline, you can you upload it also in the school. So we didn't rely by getting all the pipeline for the top data. We got only the top 10 or 20, you know, based on the school. But this is the case. You are right. If somehow we allow bad things to be in the graph, you are going to guide people in, the, in wrong things of assumptions. We can, we can have quality control while constructing the. Thank you. So maybe we should stop here because we're a little over time because of technical uh, things here, problems in the beginning too. But Assam has a student meeting at 4 30, 5 30 that Alan is uh, organizing. So please meet them if you just see that at 4 30 and let's thank them again. I really want to thank everyone for attending and thanks to me also for the effort that we've done behind this. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks very much for the seminar.